Okay, I think we're ready to start. We're ready to start today's session. Uh, I'm uh, Jim Wirch. I'm a director of the McDonald International Scholars Academy and associate vice chancellor for international affairs here at Washington University. And uh, one of my one of the perks of my job is I go around sometimes and meet really interesting people elsewhere in the world. And uh, today we have a guest, Professor Swaran Singh from Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, whom I actually first met in Shanghai. Uh, I was there for a meeting. Actually, Feng Xiaoran sitting over there. Was, uh, he's also from Fudan University in Shanghai. He was uh, one of the students that we had some WashU students and Fudan students uh, together uh, doing a course, a joint course you know, workshop on uh, nuclear disarmament. And uh, that was my lucky day to meet uh, Swaran Singh there at that same meeting. And so uh, since then, we've been in contact. I've visited him a couple times. Uh, and uh, we've started uh, looking into other ways to collaborate. Um, Swaran is here today uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University, where he's a professor. And he's also the chair for the Center for International Politics, Organization, and Disarmament. Um, it's something, uh, I visited their shop there. They have a lot of very interesting colleagues. His uh, center, uh, the larger unit, ran a special conference on post-Soviet states uh, at JNU in November. So they do a broad range of things that are quite interesting. Uh, this is part of the School of International Studies there. Uh, as some of you probably know, JNU is uh, in uh, Delhi. It's kind of has a long reputation of being the, the heart of strength in the social sciences in particular, but now very strong in sciences, uh, biology, and other sciences. But this is where a lot of the leadership for India has come from over the years at, at all different levels. So it's a very important responsibility that the university has there. And certainly in these areas like uh, international studies, people like uh, Professor S uh, Singh are very important. Um, his, he has a long list of books here. I'll just tell you about the last one, uh, to give you a title of the kind of thing he works on. He has uh, his last book, Emerging China, Prospects for Partnership in Asia, 2012 book. Uh, he deals with a very difficult topic, namely India-China relations, among others. Uh, he's got the right personality and brains to do it because it's not always easy uh, <laughs> uh, on either side of that uh, discussion. Murray was just mentioning here uh, something that's up relevant. He said he couldn't remember in the uh, recent discussions or whatever we're having in the lead up to the presidential election, uh, any mention of India. We don't talk very much about India for being you know, a, a 1.2 billion population country, and uh, it's going to be the biggest, the largest population in the world in a matter of a couple decades. And growth, uh, exciting things going on there, we don't talk about it very much. So we're very privileged today to have uh, Professor Singh here with us. And he's going to be talking about multilateralization of China-India relations. So, Soran, welcome, and we're glad to have you here today. Thank you. Can you move there, yeah. The camera will follow you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I feel better sitting here. I can see all of you. I noticed that. There are uh, some very senior people among this audience, and I feel honored. And I wish to particularly acknowledge uh, Marie Wigmore, and of course, Itai uh, sitting here with us, and several young students. Uh, I may not uh, actually tell you something completely new that you may not have heard before. Uh, but what I am going to do in initial remarks uh, is to maybe give you a perspective that I have on this issue of multilateralization uh, of China-India relations. Uh, and I'll be happy to come to specifics if there are any queries, any questions. I look forward to comments. Uh, I take it as a pilgrimage to uh, Washington University. So I uh, feel honored and privileged that I could visit here, and I think it's equally a learning experience for me to be here. When it comes to China and India, I think it's a sense of 
satisfaction that uh, some scholars in India and China have, uh, that these countries are becoming countries of interest around the world. So it is with that sense of satisfaction that I uh, speak to you uh, a fundamental shift that is occurring in China-India relations. And that is my uh, contention, that is my proposition today. Uh, that in the relationship uh, between these two large societies, uh, they are the largest in terms of population, uh, fairly large in terms of size, uh, also fairly old civilizations, uh, recently uh, seen as emerging economies, uh, both having fairly large-sized middle class, so there's a consumerism that one can notice. Uh, that makes them uh, countries of interest. Uh, and what is happening between these two countries uh, also becomes interesting because it has a bearing uh, not just on their relationship, but perhaps also on development and security of the region where they are located, and to some extent even beyond uh, the region. Jim mentioned uh, that India is not an issue in presidential debates. Uh, in Delhi, sometimes we think it's, it's good. <laughs> because normally, uh, in elections, uh, which are uh, driven by strong core national interests. Mention of other countries uh, very often does not come in a very uh, pleasant uh, formulation. Uh, and then again, immediately that comes to mind are mentions of China. Uh, and I would not be really very uh, excited to look for a similar mention for India. So I take silence on India as a positive note as far as presidential elections are concerned. Let me begin by saying that if I were to you know, close my eyes and think of, let's say, roughly 10 major issues that concern our world, our countries today, I will not be able to pinpoint even one where either my state or any state can singularly deal with those issues, whether they are issues of development or security. Uh, so what I'm saying is that perhaps uh, it is the norm that for everything we do in life uh, as nation states, uh, multilateralism is the way. So it's not specific to just China and India, but true of every nation around the world that anything that a nation wishes to do involves other nations, whether it is an issue of uh, poverty alleviation, an issue of uh, unemployment, uh, issue of pandemics, uh, terrorism, human trafficking, environment, climate change, <coughs> security of energy, uh, all of these issues require us to work in a multilateral format. Same is true for India and China. But if it is same for India and China, then perhaps it's not a very exciting subject to discuss. Uh, for China and India, this shift is perhaps far more fundamental and far more uh, deeper. Uh, that is what I plan to discuss with you today. <laughs> I also wish to immediately uh, share with you that all interrelationships of nation states that involve more than two states, which is where it is bilateral, are not all of my concern. Uh, multilateralism has also been sometimes seen as synonymous with multipolarism, or sometimes also seen similar to minilateralism. So I am only talking of multilateralism and just to make this distinction clear for all of us in just 20 seconds. Multipolarism was very popular in Cold War times, which is driven by power relationships. Uh, minilateralism is 
very often defined as agenda focused. There is one singular agenda and very often one singular power that pushes that agenda. Six party talks could be an example where there is a specific agenda and there is a specific power among the six which is pushing how negotiations are to be organized. Much of what is left is multilateralism which focuses on building institutions and norms and that is the domain that I wish to focus on looking at the shift in China-India relationship. Now what makes this a little bit unique uh, in understanding the relationship uh, is that both China and India in their own way were interested in multilateralism all these years. Uh, Chinese were part of common turn at some stage which is a kind of a multilateralism. Uh, India was uh, part of a group called non-alignment uh, but these organizations were not very clearly appreciated and accepted in the rest of the world. There were question marks on what is the agenda, what is the nature of non-alignment, what is the agenda and nature of common turn organization. Uh, that was the kind of multilateralism uh, that these states had followed uh, earlier. We are today discussing the new phase of multilateralism where China and India become part of international organizations primarily because they become influential actors. Not that they were nice guys but they are also perhaps relatively influential members of international community. That is what perhaps makes the difference. But at the same time, they become also dependent on international system. Uh, we all also hear uh, how far India and China are going to be status quoist powers. Whether they are going to change anything in international order or they are just going to preserve international order as it is. Now in this new phase, uh, both of them come into this multilateral uh, nature of relationship following their economic reforms and their uh, trade-led development models where they begin to develop relationships uh, with the outside world, uh, especially their relationships in uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, very interesting examples. Uh, historically, <coughs> if you look at China and India, there was this scenic influence in Northeast Asia, that is where Chinese cultural influence had uh, expanded and Indic influence in Southeast Asia. That is where Indian culture and commerce had expanded traditionally. And the buffer in between is called Indochina. There are of course different definitions of what it is. But understanding, one of the understanding was that they decided to have a buffer, which is not a very nice expression for countries that I am talking of. Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. Uh, and therefore, assumption was that their interface now in 90s and later could turn into clash. Uh, ASEAN was engaging India through <coughs> Cold War years as a power that could potentially countervail influence of China. Now, of course, China is a very friendly country for ASEAN now. Uh, so their engagement uh, with East Asia is the first example of uh, these powers becoming equal partners and ASEAN led several multilateral forums were to become the main first area where the, these two countries will actually become influential players in how uh, deliberations are conducted, how agendas are set. Uh, so this is a new phase and what it does here very clearly uh, is that it gives them confidence that they could actually see themselves as stakeholders in multilateral organizations, which is very different from how they looked at multilateral organizations before. Assumption was that much of multilateral organizations around United Nations was all big power dominated organizations in which the underdogs, which is again a popular expression in elections, did not have much role to play. 
that assumption, it seems, is being questioned now. That understanding is that participation in all kinds of international forums uh, is useful. There are several new forums which are also being added. <coughs> Shanghai Cooperation Organization would be a good example here, uh, which in some ways is also seen as a Chinese uh, brainchild, because Russia very often was um, busy elsewhere in Europe or engaging the United States. It was undergoing a fairly tumultuous period internally. Uh, this is a kind of a novel or new uh, experiment in multilateralization, where I think China clearly has established that it could have a different way of organizing regional security and regional development. Similarly, they have expanded from there to other organizations. <coughs> organizations like BRICS, <coughs> we will have a meeting of BRICS countries um, on 29th March now in New Delhi. And the last meeting was in um, China. Uh, or IPSA, uh, India, Brazil, South Africa. Russia, China, India, Strategic Triangle. The basic organization. Uh, several new organizations are emerging here these mid-ranking powers come together or emerging economies come together and seem to use these platforms in developing their mutual understanding but also in, in some ways influencing the agenda uh, starting afresh in, in many areas like climate change, energy security. So there is a growing sense of uh, confidence in multilateralism as a way of organizing international relations uh, and looking at India and China having stakes in those kind of models uh, of international relations. Uh, that is a big picture that is visible to us. Now how is that influencing their bilateral relations? That is an issue that we are discussing. I will give you a specific example. December 2010 was a very lucky period for New Delhi. Uh, heads of state and government of all five uh, veto-holding powers visited New Delhi in December 2010, uh, which itself was a recognition of India being engaged very differently. One of them, of course, was Wan Chiapao from China, the Prime Minister. And when two Prime Ministers were addressing the media after their meeting, Indian Prime Minister said something very interesting. <coughs> he said, Premier Wen Pao had visited New Delhi in April 2006. And since then, he was now visiting in December 2010. But meanwhile, Indian Prime Minister has met Hu Chintao and Wen Pao over 20 times. Likewise, uh, there could be several other examples. Indian Foreign Minister going to China for first official visit, but his first, his fifth meeting with the Chinese uh, Foreign Minister. One could go on adding these examples. What I am saying here is that since India and, and China have their leaders meeting in so many multilateral forums uh, all the time, and both China and India notice that more often than not, uh, they have very similar identical concerns in these meetings uh, and they have also similar and identical responses. And there is a sense of uh, common cause, there is a sense of uh, physical chemistry, born homey, uh, that develops over a period of time amongst these leaders. <coughs> 